So I want to go ahead and show you uh, the breakdown of this scene because I like the way this one turned out. Um, and I'm using Vue for this actually, so I'm not using Cinema 4D, I'm not using Blender, I'm using Vue. Um, that's my longest long-term use 3D application. Um, I just stopped using it for a very long time and I'm getting back into it simply because uh, a project that has come up uh, requires the use of it. So I'm just brushing off the the old rust uh, on my Vue skills. So, uh, But I like the way this one turned out. Um, and I want to go ahead and break down how I made the landscapes for it. And it's, they're actually s stupid easy. Um, they're all quick starts in Gaia. Uh, but I adjusted them a little bit to get better results, and I'll show you what I did. So the first thing we're going to look at is this foreground landscape and the, the mid-ground landscape. And that's actually all one landscape. So let me show you how I made that. Let's go ahead and open up Gaia, and this is the project file right here. So this is the Rolling Hills quick start. Um, let me open up another Gaia, win oops, Gaia window. Uh, and we'll look at that quick start real quick. Um, because the changes I made here don't really show you which one you're wanting to use. So it's going to be under Landscapes. And you're going to use the Rolling Hills pre uh, quick start. And this one's super simple, it's just three nodes. Um, and the landscape itself actually looks really good. Um, I like the way this particular landscape looks. And if you go kind of down, if you use Q and E while you're in the uh, viewport here, you can go up and down like this. It helps you kind of line things up. And you can see they are kind of rolling hills. We'll increase it to 1K. Um, but they aren't as rolling as I would like. And they're actually really small hills in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and it doesn't provide a rather large looking landscape. Uh, and they look, like I said, they look fine. But I didn't like the way they looked uh, by default. So... What I did is I just used this quick starter and I added um, some gradients here and I'll show you what I did and a seamless node. So in the past, uh, in some other videos that I made, I have said on numerous accounts that no one should be sleeping on the gradient nodes. Uh, they, they often come in handy for a lot of things, whether you want to do fall offs or if you want to do some kind of distancing effects, the gradients are really good to use. But, um, and I actually have a whole video dedicated to using gradients for particular things. Um, but in this video, we're using two um, linear gradients, one here at zero degrees and one here at 180 degrees, as you can see. So if I were to click between these two, you can see how this one's just flipped. You can invert it if you want, but just use the direction here. Um, I'm using mirror as well and nothing on the scale. And then we combine it using a multiply and that gives us this um, kind of rainbow shape, which is nice. Uh, and I didn't use any other effects on the landscape here. All I did was uh, put those two things together. It created this. And then I displaced it because if you, if you don't displace this plane um, or this rainbow shape, you're actually not going to have enough detail in the shape itself to do anything. So if you were to add the purlin after this, you wouldn't get these nice bumpy effects on the top. It would just be super flat. Um, there wouldn't be any little details like this in there. It would look more or less like this, where there's like a flat straight line on the top. So um, you want to add the displacement because the purlin's what's going to distort the rest of it. And uh, it's going to allow you to bring in these extra shapes. Now, it was still a little bit too flat. And this is why I really liked the Rolling Hills quick set or quick start because it already included the rugged node. Um, obviously, I can make this myself. And I'm not opposed to making these landscapes myself. They're super easy to make. It's, I mean, I do it hours every day. So, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. But having a quick start it made it easier for you guys to get started, uh, especially if you're new to Gaia. Um, and then you can just kind of play around with those quick starts and adjust them to what you need. And then you're left with something that works. After that, I just kept, again, the, the Perlin, the Rugged, and the Wizard were the original part of the quick start. Everything else we added ourselves. 
So the wizard hasn't changed, that one was all left default, and then you're left with these nice hills that you see here, um, but then also some erosion lines, some fluvial lines, um, because the fluvial node, for some reason, uh, just does not work. I, I think it's still bugged uh, to some degree. It just it seems like it just doesn't work the way it used to, and I, it's one of my favorite nodes in Gaia because it's um, you can get some really nice looking fluvial lines that just is a very minor erosion effect that you can use for like small scale applications rather than large landscapes, and it just it doesn't seem to work a lot of the time now. So it's something that I've already reported on, so I'm I'm not just complaining about it. I actually did something about it and reported it. So hopefully it'll come back with another fix, but. Um, We'll, we'll find out. Now you could add more to this. You can add like some folding maybe, or maybe some terracing, and then use a mask to uh, place the, the terracing on some of these steeper slopes if you wanted. Um, but I didn't because the, the, the look I was going for were more of the uh, maybe a central Utah plains look that we have, which is more like this. This is actually how a lot of our mountains look. They're just a little bit more peaky, I guess. Um, or maybe Montana uh, or uh, Nebraska. There's a lot of places around here that I've traveled to that have a lot of rolling hills like this. Uh, but the next thing is actually really important and we're using the seamless node. And the reason why is because it gives us these edges here and you can um, tile this landscape if you want. I don't recommend doing that for this particular scene that I created if you're trying to recreate it because then you'll just get too many similar looks and effects. But the reason why we want to use a seamless node is because if you look right here, um, if we go back to the wizard, we just have this harsh cutoff. And that's fine because our camera is actually going to be more over here. So you're actually not going to see this. And then you can duplicate this landscape. You can turn it around and, you know, 180 it and then place it somewhere else in the camera view and have like a hill here and then a hill there and then another one there. Um, but the problem is, is that you're left with these sharp edges. Um, and so instead of doing that, I just use a seamless node and then put the camera on this side of the landscape. And so now you're more, let's go into a first person view here. And one of these days we'll probably uh, have faster movement in the camera, hopefully. So now the camera is gonna be more like right here inside of view. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll have to find like a good spot. Uh, it's still a little weird using the first person. View. I rarely use it, but it's still a little kind of weird. So maybe right here. And then you're looking this way. And so now you have this foreground, this mid ground, and now you're not seeing the cutoff over here for the landscape. Um, and you're also not seeing the cutoff over here. And now you have background hills as well, and they all match similarly. So they all have like the same kind of erosional pattern because they're in the same geolocation. Um, and that's important because we want it to look similar. I mean, maybe right here would be a better shot. Um, but what it does is it just creates this edge um, without having to repeat the same landscape over and over again. You could export mutations as well, and that would work just fine. Um, but I think this is a better application. That's what I did. And then we were left with, with this. So um, the seed that I used was different. I kind of changed the seed around for the hills themselves until I found something that matched more of what I wanted. Um, but as you can see here, we have this foreground. This is all one landscape right here. We have this foreground and then it dips down into um, the valley. So let's go back to Gaia. It dips down into, not that one, let's close this one. <clears throat> dips down, comes back up, and then again after that it dips down again. Uh, it's a very minor dip in this case because I actually kind of squashed it in Vue. Uh, but it dips down again a little bit and then comes up just ever so slightly right here. You're not seeing it right here because this is all mostly the middle ground. Um, but it comes up just a tiny little bit, like right there, just enough to make it uh, uh, slope back up again. And, and it plays absolutely no role in what's happening here. But I've kind of 
stretched and resized the landscape in blue a little bit. And then the mountainscape in the background is just a range. Um, but if you wanted to use a quick start and not have to go through the trouble of making sure everything is uh, looking really rocky and mountainous like that, you can use a quick start, another quick start. And I highly recommend, I, I know a lot of people might think that quick starts are just kind of cheating, but they're not. I highly recommend going into quick starts and then learning how a lot of these things work. Um, let me see if I can, I think it's this one right here, Flowing Mountains, has very similar looks. Uh, it's very harshly eroded um, and rocky. They're using this shear right here. And uh, you can use something like right here. Uh, you can probably put in another gradient, but a radial gradient this time and use that as a mask for the igneous. And now you have this zero edge effect that you'll get. Um, or we can try another, let's try another one. Uh, Vu itself actually has uh, a zero edge option built in for its own procedural and height field landscapes. And that's what I used for this image. It's actually, a zero edged landscape. Um, so let's go in and see if we can find one that's more of a gradient. I don't think it's going to be any of these. No, that one right there might work. Actually, you know what? Maybe I, I can't remember, but maybe I did use this quick start for it. Probably because that looks very much like, yeah. So that's that mountain right there. So I used this one. I can't quite remember because <laughs> it's, I mean, I was like, it was like three or four o'clock in the morning and I had been awake for about almost 20 hours at that point. So, but in any case, uh, you can just use this quick starter. It's the mountain range two. And um, all I did, yeah, it's all coming back to me. All I did is I used the snowfall and I applied it to the thermal. And then I just changed the snow line until it, it got to wherever, right there, maybe a little higher, like right there. And then in Vue, um, it has a zero edge already. Um, so it's actually really flat, even more so right here. And then on the sides a little bit. And then all I did is I stretched it a little bit longer, not by much, because you actually don't want to restretch these or you don't want to stretch them on the Y uh, very much because it's uh, it'll ruin shapes and features that you would normally get. So it's also the largest landscape. This is a very small hill. And then this landscape just kind of butts up right against the edge of the hill and then is stretched just a little bit towards the edges. And you can see it's a little, not as tall. It Normally it would probably be like right there the peak would be, but it's stretched out a little bit so it kind of reduced it in size um, and made it a little bit more wide uh, but not by much and it still looks fine <clears throat> and then I uh, used my own custom materials in Vue for the foreground the midground and the mountain so I actually didn't export any color maps from Gaia uh, well I lied hold on <laughs> I'm not lying I'm just forgetting I created a color map for the mountain and it was just a simple texture and I don't I don't know if I'll be able to recreate that because I can't remember the sat map that I used, but I can just show you real quick what I did. So I did um, a texture. And uh, one sat map, and I made sure it was mostly green. I know that much, uh, sat map. And uh, we'll just find one that was mostly green. Something like that. Um, or even like that. That one would work just fine. That I, that might even be the one that I used. Uh, or this one would be a good one. That's a really nice like mountain look. And then I didn't export it with the snow applied to the sat map because that in 3D applications, I mean, adding the snow to your sat map when you're doing a Gaia build and showing off the build in Gaia is totally fine. But when you're going from another 3D or from Gaia to a different 3D application, in my opinion, it's actually better to not make a normal map or a 
color map that has your snow applied to it. So if I were to make a normal map, I would make one right here uh, before the snow. So I'll put it on the thermal. And then uh, I would export just this sat map. And then I would use the mask that I get from the snow to apply the, the snow material in the other 3D application. So in Vue, um, I use that same mask to apply the snow here. And what that does is it allows me to control the snow material better. Um, it doesn't have any underlying white color, which can be distracting, especially if you're not going to be using snow. Like maybe you wanted it just to create some, uh, some smooth eroded surfaces in these crevices where the snow would be like after a snowpack during like the late spring, early summer when the snow might be thawing that can work really well, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted snow specifically in certain areas and I wanted to be able to control that material, increase the amount I have or decrease the amount I have. And you wouldn't be able to do that if you added the white color to your sat map, because then if you reduce the snow, <clears throat> If you reduced the snow in your other 3D application, it would just be uncovering the white color underneath where the snow is, and then it would just be a very flat white. But since I used the mask and just the basic set map, what I was able to get is um, a finer control over the snow. So instead of having the snow appear everywhere the mask is, I reduced it a little bit, which allowed for things like this little patchy snow there and there. Um, and it also allowed me to play with the highlights of the snow. So now when the sun hits the snow, it takes a little bit of the sunlight color, which is reflecting off the snow rather than just absorbing all of it and just not uh, taking on the color of the sun uh, and creating these nice highlighted snow effects. Um, the scale of the snow was really large, so there's not a whole lot of small details in there. I didn't get like a lot of individual sh shimmering to the snow, but that's fine. This is further away anyways, and that kind of effect would just be dulled by um, the atmosphere anyways. So, But in any case, it, it allows for that kind of finer control. Um, the materials, uh, this is the sat map that I exported from Gaia, but I added a small amount of bump to it in Vue, and that creates these sharper, more rocky details than what I had before. And that's fine, that's what I would do in any other application. I mean, there's not a lot here that I would do in like Cinema 4D, um, <clears throat> that I wouldn't do. I, I don't know if I said would do or wouldn't, but I would do this scene exactly the same way in Cinema 4D with like Octane or... Uh, corona render. I'd probably be using Corona render right now. Um, just very low altitude, kind of like a dusk or early morning, depending on your perspective, kind of look. And then a very soft sun, so we get very soft shadows, very soft fall off. And then plants scattered in the foreground, because I'm not going to scatter across this whole thing. That would be way too many plant populations. Um, or scatters and that would just drain resources. So the best thing you can do in that situation is if you look closely, this foreground has plants scattered all over it and I'm just using a fall off so that the plants only spread to a certain amount. Right here inside of view, right in this area, um, there is a hidden object that doesn't cast shadows, it doesn't interact with the landscape and all it does is it blocks the population of plants further into the midground. So we have plants everywhere in the foreground, which is what we want, um, but then the, the midground has none of it. And then what you do after that is you just make a material that is a similar color to your plants, and you just kind of play with a bump that kind of fake the way the plants look. Uh, you can even use displacement if you wanted, so you can have some uh, some interacting shadows, but I didn't. I just applied a color map that has enough variety in color where it's not all a single color. Um, as you can see here, like in the crevices of the landscape, there's different colors for like dirt and whatnot, and that's all a part of the fractal material. And then the uh, uh, the bump applied to it just is a nice softer bump that kind of mimics the look of the plants. So that's all I did. There's no plant scatters on this. Um, and then there's no plants absolutely nowhere in the in the far background. No trees, no grass, no anything. It's just all snow and rock. Um, and if it were a bright sunny day, um, you would see the uh, plants, fake quote unquote plants in the color map from the set map from Gaia in the green coloring. Um, 
then it would just be similar colored to these plants. I would just color correct it so that the greens are about the same color. Um, and that's it. So I know it's not like a full breakdown from start to finish, but um, I just needed something to show you guys on how I would go about making these rolling hills because that would be the hardest part of this, in my opinion, is the uh, faking the rolling hills all in one single landscape. Uh, there's only two landscapes here, this one and the background mountains, and that's it. Um, and they were both just sat or starter quick starts from Gaia. And then you just adjust them. But it's really important that when you're doing the hills, uh, that you do what I showed you at the beginning with the, the two gradients, and you flip one 180 degrees and you multiply them together. And you just adjust that multiplication slider in the combine node to whatever degree you want. I used 100%, but if you want less, you can have less. You can use a shaper node so you can get it to be more bulbous or more spiky, more like a peak. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do, um, but I just did the very bare minimum uh, because I just wanted to put something together real quick. So there's that. In any case, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and the breakdown. Um, I will probably post a video uh, of me doing a similar scene, and I'll just show you guys exactly what I did. But I'm going to do that in Vue, because I'm not going back exclusively to Vue, um, but I am going to be using it more often um, because of this project that's come up. And I just, I miss Vue. I love Vue a lot. It was the program that got me started in uh, making uh, CGI landscapes. Um, and it was a very good entry point for me. Um, and it, it was because of their PLEs and just Eon being nice and letting me use it because I was a, a poor student. Not, not a college student, I was actually in high school. I didn't have a job. My parents, they never would have understood my want or desire to get into 3D landscapes because they're more traditional artists. Um, at least my mom, like everybody in my family is more of an artist in some to some degree except for my dad. He doesn't really do a lot of drawing or anything like that, but he loves art. So it's not that he hates it. He just he just doesn't do it himself, but he loves it. He has pictures everywhere in the house of things that his kids have drawn, things that I have rendered, and so on and so forth. So, um, But they never would have understood the, the desire to buy a, a, a multi-thousand dollar piece of computer software and let me play with it. So Eon software was just nice. They let me play around with Vue on a very limited version of it. Um, and then they eventually made the PLE, which made things a lot easier. And then I eventually had money where I could buy it. So um, I want to go back to Vue. I think it's a, a nice program. I, I will still be doing stuff in Cinema 4D and I'm getting into Houdini, as you can see here. I have the, uh, whatever the free version of Houdini is right here. Um, so I will be trying to get into more other software packages for you guys, but they are completely different pieces of software. So that takes a lot of learning. And Houdini is one of those programs that I have used in the past for some projects. Um, I, I actually used Houdini back in like the 2010s, believe it or not, uh, back before it really blew up to what it is now. Um, but I just never stuck with it. It was just, it was too much of a dev tool in my opinion. It's it's powerful with what you can do, but it's there's a reason why I use Gaia and not World Machine anymore, because World Machine is one of those things where you can just do things for days in it, which is fine, but that's not what I need. What I need are just basic tools to get the picture rendered. Um, and Houdini is one of those programs where it's just like, there's too much there for me to really care about, uh, but I want to learn it. I want to learn it because you guys are interested in it. Um, and also just because it's a good tool to have in the bag. So any case, thank you for watching. And I'll see you in the next one.